Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I definitely am not an expert, but uh, but I am glad that our lab meetings are some of the more fun ones. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for joining for this talk. It's a great pleasure to uh, be here virtually. I'm going to talk about um, our recent work on semantically driven robot assistance and user interaction, and go over kind of several recent papers under this uh, gen general research umbrella. Um, I can't see any of you at this point. I can't see the chat. So if you have a question, I'm happy to make this interactive. So I'll pause for questions once in a while, but please do feel free uh, to interrupt as we go. So uh, to kick things off, this is a slide I kind of use to motivate kind of, or, or, or bring home what, what motivates me and my work. Um, and that's the question of how how do we develop robust autonomous systems that operate in human environments? To me, human environments are um, really, really uh, the one of the most exciting domains for robotics. We can send robots to Mars, and yet we still can't have a robot clean up our kitchen. The environments that we as humans find most comfortable, most easy to operate in are also the ones that are presenting the greatest challenge to robotic systems. And at the heart of that challenge are the humans themselves. We are diverse, we each want our own stuff, and we wanna interact in slightly different ways. Uh, basically, uh, humans are what makes the robots world so, so challenging uh, in these domains. And, and that's what really uh, kind of captures my imagination about what, what robots ought to be and should be and could be and how to uh, tackle those uh, challenges. Uh, in particular, within that big scope, uh, that big problem space, I'm interested right now in this slice that has to do with semantic reasoning and how can we leverage semantic reasoning to achieve more robust autonomy, better interaction, and kind of enhance the behavior of these autonomous systems. Now that term semantic reasoning carries uh, a lot of baggage. Uh, it's, it's used for anything and everything. Um, and just to kind of, uh, here, here's some examples of semant the types of semantic information we could be talking about. If we're talking about mapping, we could uh, semantically label regions of space as hallways or offices, um, or we could build 3D semantic maps, which are not even visualized here. Um, we could do semantic scene graphs and talk about the semantic uh, relationships between objects. And like, for example, that these horses are not just standing next to a green carriage, but are actually pulling the carriage and the people there are, are riding in that carriage. Um, or we could drill down and look at the semantics of objects, which could mean many different things, but for example, uh, there's this nice work from Doe et al looking at how do you semantically segment objects into their functional parts so that you can understand which parts are the outsides of objects versus for grasping versus for containing other things. So all of these are examples of what people call semantics or semantic information, but we need a better term uh, or, or kind of a better definition uh, to pull all this together. And so I'm, I'm just I'm going to say that to me, semantics is a type of data abstraction, always going from sort of some sort of low level data source, such as pixels, up to a more abstract representation. And that representation, because it becomes more symbolic, we usually um, use some form of word labels to capture that abstract um, uh, meaning or, or categorization. Uh, and those word, those word choices represent concepts, facts, ideas, or beliefs about the world, about that object, about the relationship of that object, right? It tells us something um, meaningful at that idea, idea stage. So lots of words there. The big takeaway, and I'll come back to this, is semantics is a mapping from low level uh, sensor data up to more abstract data, often taking the form of words, right? And because words are the way that we humans interact with each other and communicate information, um, one of the interesting things to me about semantics is it opens the door to now talking to humans about low level sensor data. If you can abstract to semantics, you're halfway to actually being able to communicate about that same low level data, which is super, super cool. Anyway, so kind of in that space, again, tying together the two ideas of semantic reasoning and abstraction with my love of uh, everyday human environments, um, let me show you a little bit kind of high level view of the type of work we've been uh, doing in the last few years. So if you take kind of a household, we've been looking at how do robots uh, more intelligently search for objects. So if I say, hey, could you grab me a fork? I expect the robot to go and into the kitchen and open the top drawer 
uh, not the bottom drawer, top drawer, probably near the dishwasher, right? So how, do, how does that kind of semantic mapping and location, uh, where does that information come from, that bias? Uh, we talk about uh, modeling object state, uh, such as is a particular object clean or dirty or full or empty or more likely to be um, uh, metallic or plastic. Um, we um, talk about uh, using semantics for task repair and recovery. So if something goes wrong, the object can't find, the robot can't find an object, how does it recover and just not just give up on its task, but maybe use something else. Uh, we've looked at grasping, semantic grasping in particular, proactive user assistance, and, and finally interaction in this uh, semantic space. So lots and lots of different projects um, in this setting of household robotics, looking at semantics and how it plays into autonomy in different ways. What I'm going to do today is kind of jump around and talk about several of these at a fairly fast pace. Uh, if you want to hear details, we can chat afterwards, uh, whatever else, happy to point you to papers as well. Um, but uh, really focusing on kind of what, what I think are the core key takeaways of several of these works. And to kick things off, I'm going to start with object grasping, in particular semantic grasping uh, specifically. And the idea of semantic grasping, you know, for, for years, decades, we spent a lot of time getting robots to just grasp stuff, um, not semantically at all, but just pick it up without dropping it. And now that we can do that, uh, this idea of, of semantic grasping is kind of the next milestone where you're going to grasp with intent to do something with that object. And so as a result, you know, humans do this all the time. But let's take the steaming cup of coffee in the image there. Um, because it's apparently hot and steaming, um, you don't want to grasp the cup around its, its middle. You want to hold the handle, right? Um, this is uh, a constraint that we call an object constraint. So it's constrained by the object state. It's very hot right now. You want to use the handle. Uh, in other cases, you are constrained by the task. Let's say I want to pour that cup out. Um, if I grab it in such a way that I'm, my hand is covering the top opening and then I try pouring, I'm going to get coffee all over my hand. So, so there my grasp is constrained also by the task we want to do. And so there's the question of how do we get robots to reason about grasping both in the context of object constraints as well as task constraints. Here's an example of a um, kind of task constrained grasp. So if I said use this object for scooping, all I'm telling you is, is, is it's just the task is scoop and the robot will execute something like this. But what we wanna do is go, and, and this is kind of where prior work stops is mostly on just constraining on the task uh, what we want to do is more of this um, contextual grasping, where it's also contextualized by uh, the state of the object. Is it a metal or a plastic object? Is it clean or dirty? Is it full or empty, hot or cold, right? And, and so having those factors influence the behavior of the robot. So um, there is a data set we created to do that. I'll talk about that in a minute. Let me talk about the sensing that we do first um, to make that happen. So. Um, as I said, kind of context drives this type of grasping. The robot has to think about the semantic context sort of of, of the grasp. Um, we have a number of sensors. We don't actually use this really old connect. It's just in the image. We use RGBD data of the, of the scene. And then we use something called a SIO sensor, so a spectrometer to help us detect the material of the object. I'll show you that in a minute. And then we also obtain from our fictitious user the task that we want to perform, scooping, for example, um, and the state of the object, in this case, empty. Now, in this work, we're going to get the state, right, clean or, or dirty, empty or full, from the user. Um, our next, my next uh, topic will talk about how do we relax that assumption and, and uh, infer that state automatically. But for here, for this part, just assume it's known. OK. So this is the kind of context we want to collect. Let me show how we collect it. So here's our robot. It has this um, object in front. And it's, no, it's been told to scoop and that this thing is empty. Um, so it's going to use its RGBD uh, camera to uh, perform object recognition. It's going to say, OK, cool, this is a spatula. Um, and then it's going to segment that object into semantically meaningful components. Um, this is a work by Doadal called affordance net, a uh, really cool technique out of ICRA 2018 on functionally 
segmenting objects into uh, portions such as the, the, the part that you grasp, but the part that supports the ac action part of the object. Um, now, there's a lot of prior work on segmenting objects. This is not, you know, kind of not our contribution at all. I just want to show this slide to show why we use this method. Um, it's really, really nice because you can see that it, it, because it's a functional segmentation, um, you can generalize quite easily to uh, new objects that the robot's never seen before. Because if it can analyze the object and kind of figure out which part is the opening, then, for example, when it learns to grasp things for pouring, it learns not to cover the opening for pouring because otherwise you're, you're blocking uh, things with the gripper. Um, and so you could do that with something like, let's say it's never seen this ladle. It would know not to grasp the red portion, right, that, that uh, opening um, for pouring because that would not make any sense. And that's really, really helpful to be able to, to uh, generalize in this way. So this is uh, affordance snap. We, we leverage it uh, in this work. It's really cool. Um, so this gives us the, we now have the identity of the object and we have this segmentation of its functional parts. The next thing we do is detect the material of the object. Um, and that was the quick video, I'll, I'll play it again in a second, uh, of the robot using a handheld spectrometer. You can buy it for about 300 bucks. I'm gonna play it again, here we go. Um, and it's not even touching the object. Uh, it gets an array of data from the spectrometer uh, readings, throws that into an LSTM and uh, out comes a classifier output that says that this material is plastic as opposed to glass or cloth or paper or wood uh, or one of the other categories it's been trained on. So um, really, really cool to have the robot autonomously identify the material of the object. We use this um, in a number of projects uh, here to be careful about how we grasp certain items, um, metal knives, the blades of certain like metal knives that are sharp, we treat differently than plastic knives, for example. Um, but in other work, we treat this differently because you don't wanna put metal things in the microwave, for example, and that's cool to know. All right, um, so that's the material. And the last thing we do, so now we have, we've collected like all kinds of background context about this object. The next thing we gotta know is um, how do we, you know, which grasp do we use to actually perform the task of scooping using this empty spatula that consists of uh, two functional parts and is made of plastic. Um, and so what we do is we run a, just a generic grasp sampler and the sampler returns antipodal grasps that are stable. So all the places you could place the gripper and get uh, successfully pick up the object. And our next goal is just to train a model to rank these grasps from best to worst for this particular task and its context. To, uh, the model we use to learn that task is something called a wide and deep neural model. Uh, this is work from Cheng et al. in 2016 out of Google the, uh, as a recommender system, completely outside of robotics. So if you take a, a shallow linear neural model, um, it tends to be very, very good at memorizing prior examples that it's seen. Um, not so great at generalizing. But if you take a really deep network, as we've seen in a lot of work, really deep models generalize really, really well. Sometimes they get to the point where they generalize a little bit too much. Um, and so there's this uh, idea of this, this wide and deep model is a jointly trained shallow linear model and deep neural network um, that are jointly trained uh, to perform this classification task and it kind of gets the best of both worlds in terms of generalization and memorization of, of, of objects. So um, that's the model that we use. And then we, uh, to figure out um, how to pick up a given uh, object, given all this information, we, we uh, evaluate each of these grasps one at a time, obtain a grasp suitability score, and then select the max grasp, the most suitable grasp. So here's the grasp that we select for this object. And um, we've, I already mentioned training this. Um, there's no really good, wasn't a very good data set for semantic grasping prior to this work. So we created our own data set of 14,000 uh, semantic grasps covering um, five different object classes. So we took cups, for example, lots of different cups, paper cups, wooden cups, plastic cups, glass cups. Um, and then we added lots of different states like hot, cold, empty, full, and so on. And so we have 14, at the time it was the largest semantic grasping data set. Then six months later, we did a bigger one that was a quarter of a million grasps 
So if you want to get into semantic grasping, take a look at some of those. Um, and so this we with you know we trained on some subset of this eighty percent and held out uh, unseen combinations of objects and, and states uh, for for uh, testing. Uh, I didn't really have time to go through uh, our baselines. We, there are several baselines we run in the paper that are um, visual based uh, and, and don't use quite as rich of a set of state of context as our work. Um, and our method cage here in green um, kind of has certainly has the highest uh, performance out of any baseline. Um, there's a nice ablation study uh, evaluation on the right as well that, that, that kind of analyzes the benefits of this wide and deep network and shows that um, both the wide and deep elements actually contribute to the behavior of the uh, performance of the model, as well as all the various contextual information uh, is being used and is useful. Um, so this is fun. Let me show you videos because it's a robots, robots and we want videos. Um, so the, this video will show you side by side, uh, either the same object as is in this example, um, so this, this is an object that's being used for two different tasks. On the left is scooping, on the right is handing it to somebody. So you'll see different grasps. And in some of the other examples, you'll see that the, it might be the same object for the same task, but the state of the object might be different. One is full and the other is not. So here's the video. So when handing it to somebody on the right, you, sh you hand it to them, you leave the handle free, right? And when the, the cup is empty, the robot goes ahead and puts its gripper right inside versus when it's hot, it does not. When it's handing something, again, it tries to do it differently depending on the state of the object. And this is it poking people with, with new objects. It's figured out that it should poke somebody with the sharp end of a pot, which is, I guess, functionally correct. All right, any, any questions on um, how, we, how we grasp things semantically? I have a question. Um, where did you get the labels for the for labeling, like uh, which parts of the objects are like? You know, like the These, way? yeah, we considered crowdsourcing this, but in the end, this is hand labeled. Um, it's there's an interface that makes it really, really quick for us to label. Uh, oh, one thing I should say. So, a, it's hand labeled. Uh, there's another work where it's it's more crowdsourced that I mentioned uh, with. Um, uh, Aditya Morali is the, the first author and Animesh um, Gar, no, no um, Abhinav Gupta is a co-author as well. Um, one thing I should mention about this work is that what we say what in training is suitable or not is of course gonna be propagated to what the model learns. And I have to say, we the things we taught it are very, a little bit human centric, right? We It might be okay for the robot, like maybe the robot doesn't mind grabbing really, really hot cups around the base of the cup, the way humans mind, because we get burned. Um, we uh, decide since our evaluators may at some point be human to just go with human preferences for these grasps. So if you're ever considering using this data set, it has a lot of human bias in terms of grasping. Um, and if, uh, you know, if your robot really is in, not sensitive to heat, um, maybe a different distribution of grasps is more suitable. Uh, that's a design choice um, that I thought it should mention. Any other questions? All right, great. So one thing we cheated on in that past work was that um, we had the user provide the state of the object. And let's talk about, um, how we could have done that differently. Let's talk about modeling object state, semantic object state more generally. Now in robotics, there's been a, a lot of work on modeling um, object states from all kinds of different uh, input modalities, everything from tapping on objects and from the sound, trying to infer its material or fullness um, to visually inspecting objects to multimodal techniques and so on. So really, really rich body of work there. Um, one common factor across all of these, including our prior work, is that semantic information is encoded in something called a triple. So for example, cup is a container, right? Cup is made of glass. Um, these, this is basically a, what, what's called a binary representation because it's either, it's, it's, uh, these triples are either true or false, right? And they relate to uh, factors, uh, a cup and, and, and um, 
its material property glass or ceramic or fragile. Uh, and this, this kind of triple formalization has been, you can, you can visualize it as a graph or a tree, but fundamentally it's, it's basically an edge between two nodes. And uh, it's really cool. There's a lot of work that's been done there, but one of the limitations about this fundamental um, representation is it doesn't take advantage uh, as easily as it could of mutual information. So for example, if I know, you see this cup right here on the cabinet shelf, right? And if I showed you this picture and I said, is it clean or dirty? Okay, think for yourself, what's the answer? Is that cup clean or dirty? Right, it should be clean, I hope. It really looks clean. Like we only put clean things in cabinets like that, right? Um, and so the fact that we see this cup in the cabinet should significantly influence um, the, our knowledge of what of this state of the cup in, in terms of cleanliness. But if, if all we're doing is maintaining kind of these individual binary relationships and learning that is actually, um, well, possible, but hard because it requires the model to have a lot of examples and to learn those relationships uh, in a more indirect way. And so recently in other uh, subfields of AI, and not now coming into robotics, what we're seeing is the emergence of NRE representations for semantic data, which don't just relate to concepts with a single edge, but um, look at combinations of uh, interrelated properties. So for example, uh, cups in the sink are more likely to be dirty. Cap cups in the cabinet are more likely to be clean, right? So these, these are more interrelated and these are more interrelated. Um, and so if you know that you have a cup and you say, well, I don't know if it's in the sink or in the cabinet, I'm not really sure. And then you say, oh, I see it in the cabinet. It's much more likely to now be clean than dirty in this representation. I'm kind of going over it at a very high level very quickly, but hopefully you get the idea that what we're doing is, is kind of, um, we're able to represent uh, co-occurrence of um, uh, properties more directly in this through this NRE representation. And the NRE re representation could be binary with n equals two, but it could be something like n equals five, right? It could really uh, scale. Um, and so we wanted to try this for semantic object state, to modeling object states for robots. Uh, as I said, this has kind of been prototyped in other areas of AI. Um, this turned out to be hard, and the hard part was getting the data. Uh, so many things about robot robotics are hard because of data. Um, we had a hard time getting the type of rich data uh, we wanted because it's not, um, it's easy to ask someone, are cups, is this cup ceramic? But getting uh, information like, is this ceramic cup blue and full and hard and at room temperature in the sink in the kitchen? Uh, requires people to imagine a whole scene, basically. And so that's what we did. I'm not going to go through all the details, but it's like layers and layers of crowdsourcing where we crowdsource scenarios, then uses of objects, had people kind of mentally imagine certain objects and then give us more and more information uh, about them. And so we created, we, we were able to create these kind of semantically meaningful contextual scenes, like this cup I just described in the sink. And you can look at this picture and say, yeah, I'm not going to drink that. Right, it's full of some liquid. Should you drink it? Probably not. It's dirty, right? Um, all of us as humans have this strong, strong prior that this is a cup you should not drink, right? And here's another. Here's a toy knife that's gray and blunt and plastic at room temperature on the floor in the children's room was one of the scenarios. So we collected lots of these, about uh, fourteen hundred examples. Um, and then we wanted to learn a model that, that uh, given partial scenes, predicted the missing features. And in particular, we trained a transformer for modeling these NRE relations. So we embed lots of information. I'm going to have another slide that shows it a little bit better. Um, we embed um, the value, right? So this is a cup that's blue, thick, ceramic, full. Um, and then to training this thing, what we do is we take these combinations of uh, features are out in this scenario, and then we mask out certain things. So for example, we mask out the location, sink. And then we train the model to see if we can guess, the, uh, if, if we can predict the right uh, location or and keep training it until it does, right? Um, and we can do this iteratively. So we only have 1400 object combinations, but because we can mask different parts, I can here mask sink, and now I can mask the, the material property, ceramic, 
or I can mask both sink and ceramic, right? I can keep uh, doing different combinations of this for training. And I can do this for other types of cups and so on. And the cool thing about this model is that um, you can now ask queries at very, very different levels of abstraction. I can say, um, is this ceramic cup fragile? And then the only thing I'm specifying is that this is a cup and it's ceramic and I'm leaving everything else blank. I'm having the model fill it in about whether it's fragile or not. Um, or I can take an image that so I can have a robot drive around and look at this, right? The scene of this rack on the wall with cups. And you can say, is this object clean? Uh, how do you describe this object? It's a cup that's white and ceramic, room temperature on the rack in the kitchen. That's all information I could get from sensors on board the robot. Um, is it clean? Can we now? This this relates back to the work on semantic grasping, right? This is what we were missing. How do I know that this object is clean? Well, generally people only put clean things on these racks, right? And so you could you could now answer this question with this uh, algorithm. Um, the attention maps for these are pretty cool. I'm going to skip those though. Um, our data set for that is called Link Learning Instance Level Entering Knowledge Data Set. As I said, uh, about fourteen hundred. 1,457 object instances, very, very rich data set. And um, then we ran it, we, we ran tests, withheld data, uh, ran lots of statistical tests about how well this model is able to predict missing information about objects. Um, and it, it works really, really well. Again, I'm not having, I don't have time to go over the, some of the really cool baselines um, like Tucker Plus and so on. Um, our other leading method was uh, MLNs, uh, Markov Logic Networks, uh, somewhat surprisingly, um, which worked also quite well, not quite as well, but um, second best, but have an awful, awful uh, runtime uh, both for both training and testing. So that, that makes them really impractical kind of in modern day. Uh, they're really, really hard to scale. All right. so. Um, so that's been fun. And then one last fun thing we did was we did a scavenger hunt. So just for predicting the location of objects, we created a house and we asked people. We wanted to see how well we st stuck up, uh, stack up to human participants. So we um, had like a little scavenger hunt that said, all right, look for a wet sponge. Where, which locations would you check? And then we would see how quickly people found objects and how quickly the robot could find objects. Um, and basically, so in dark blue here is humans, first try, second try, third try for finding the object. And basically by the third try, people in an environment they've never seen, right? They've, they're just given a generic household. People find it 91% on the third try. Our algorithm's 88% on the third try, uh, followed by some of the other baselines. So we're almost getting up there to human level performance, a little bit not as good as humans, uh, but that's pretty, pretty fun. So that was an interesting test to run. Um, any questions on this uh, object modeling part before I keep going? And you can always ask questions at the end too. Um, what was the difference between like humans and your method? Like what, could you be more specific on the failure cases too? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't remember. I, I think the robot uh, maybe given more training, I, I think it all comes down to training data, right? And, and we just, we don't currently have more. Um, as you can see by third guess, the two methods, the two are almost the same. What the big difference was that humans were better, were more on point with their first guess and robots were like, well, it could be one of these, let me kind of go to one of them. Um, and so I feel like the robot was, like often confuse the top two locations that are most likely versus humans were a little bit better, had the edge and guessing it on the first try. So it's not that the robot was completely off and was looking for like sponges on the couch. Um, it might just look for them on the counter versus instead of in the sink directly. It probably should have looked in the sink first, but it'll look on the counter first and then in the sink, that, that kind of stuff. So they weren't egregious errors. Uh, but it it was it really needs a little bit just more to optimize. Um, are any of the baselines here uh, considering a binary relationship? Yes, I should have said that. Yes, the the, the baselines are considering binary re representations. 
And they work slightly differently, but they do look at this as a, a binary semantic representation underneath kind of the reasoning framework. And so I think where we get the edge and why even with the amount of data that we have is that the, the model is able to understand the kind of a complex interrelationship between these properties more efficiently than some of the other methods. Yeah, great questions. Okay, great. Let me talk about a, a recent work then. Um, so we talked about picking stuff up and getting the state of objects. Um, and let's talk about this work that we're going to present at Coral uh, in December on actually doing something with these objects, which is in this case, uh, not too much, but now uh, proactively assisting users by fetching items. So in this picture, there's a tennis bag and the robots getting a tennis bag for the user. And so uh, in particular, you know, there's, uh, to me, this at a very, very, very high level, there's two types of robot assistants. One is reactive where someone, I have to say, tell the robot, go get me something, go get me my tennis bag. And then I have to wait and sit around and the robot slowly goes somewhere, finds the thing and slowly brings it back. Um, and, and there's two issues there. One is that um, there's a burden on the user to constantly ask for every single thing, right? And eventually that gets tiring. Um, and the second thing is that our robots, at least for the next foreseeable future, are kind of slow, right? And so honestly, it would be faster for me to go get that tennis bag, most likely, than to wait for the robot. That one day will change, but for now, that's where we are. Um, and so that got us thinking about proactive assistance, uh, which from the user side makes uh, is maybe a little bit more uh, preferable for a variety of reasons. But one is that instead of me constantly uh, telling the robot what to do, having it anticipate my need and knowing that it's slow, maybe take the time to go ahead and fetch my bag ahead of time and then come and tell me, I know you like to play tennis on Tuesdays. I set your tennis bag by the door um, or just bring me or leave it or don't say anything, whatever the interface is, but having the robot anticipate the needs and fetch items ahead of time. Um, so that's, that's what we're exploring in this work is this idea of proactive assistance through uh, moving objects and providing objects, kind of like a robot butler. Now, there's a number of ways you could go around this problem. Um, we made a big design choice, which was that we are going to focus only on objects and in particular, we're going to uh, observe how objects move in space. So here in this diagram in the middle, what you're seeing is that it's really hard to tell what's happening. But basically, uh, as the morning progresses to breakfast, the counter, the milk, cereal, and bowl start to appear on the counter. And then after breakfast is done, the bowl's in the sink, and the milk is back in the fridge. Uh, and and um, cereals back in the in the cabinet and so on, right? So objects move around. And in particular, we decided we're not going to observe humans themselves. Uh, in particular, humans exist and presumably these objects move because people move them around. But we're not running activity recognition. Um, again, design choice, but uh, expecting to for the robot to actually model every single human activity is currently impractical. It's just from a, from a computational and, and, and classification standpoint, it's going to be really lossy. Um, and the other factor is that um, having the robot follow you around and kind of watch you at all times in all rooms is kind of creepy. And putting cameras in all rooms also invasion of privacy to some degree. So we decided to forget it. Where the robot's going to wander around the environment. It's going to watch objects come and go. And once it's confident that it can predict with high certainty that it, you need something, it's going to uh, try to provide you that object. Um, and so that's what we do. We have the robot watch how uh, the environment changes over time, over some number of days. Um, and then it, uh, so it observes human activities of everyday life. Then it learns a model, a graph neural network in this case, that is conditioned on the current time of day and the current state of the world. So it looks at the current state, the time, and then predicts into the future what the likely oops, state of the world will be at some future time step, delta, plus, you know, current time plus delta. And if it can predict with high certainty that certain things will move, it'll go ahead and 
perform those assistive actions by getting out the cereal and getting out the bowl, et cetera. By the way, it's really interesting. If it figures, if you decide not to eat breakfast that day, this, we have a little video in it that I don't have in this talk, but if you just, if the user's like, yeah, that's nice. Thanks for bringing up my cereal. I'm not eating that. And you know, that's it. Um, what, what's happened later in the day, um, the robot will automatically put it away with this model because it'll be like, it, it'll look at the time and it'll say, oh wait, it's like 11 o'clock. The cereal shouldn't be on the counter anymore. And it goes ahead and, and puts everything away. So even when it predicts incorrectly, uh, if you give it time, it'll put it all, un undo it and put it away, which is uh, automatic and kind of fun uh, byproduct of this, of this model. Um, a few more details. I'm not going to go through this in detail. It's a gra generative graph neural network. So it takes in this um, tree structure, but basically the current scene graph of the environment, which can uh, be probabilistic if we don't necessarily know where certain objects are, current time, and predicts another uh, probabilistic graph about where things are. We can take the most likely location um, of a predicted location for each object. Um, let me see what's going on with my clicker. There we go. Uh, to simulate on this, we took um, a simulator called Virtual Home. Uh, there's a little video from it. It's a household, there's a user, lots of uh, different objects the user can interact with, things that can, the user can place, cabinets they can open, and so on. And again, we did a couple of layers of crowdsourcing, first getting people's um, routines. Then we uh, hired scripters to write different ways to eat breakfast. So we would have like short breakfast, long breakfast, this type of breakfast, this other type of breakfast. And then, you know, eventually what we ended up with are these households um, that have different patterns of, of behavior. So this is two months, two months, no, 40 days, um, 40 days of data from two different households. And you can see household A, the left one, this person works from home. So they like get up, they eat breakfast, then they spend a lot of time on the computer in the middle of the day, but they also kind of do a lot of socializing in the middle of the day for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but, uh, and then they have us really long dinners. The person on the right goes out to work um, and prefers to eat really, really quickly. And they have other, other habits, like when they like to shower, how many showers they take. And so there's this, um, the idea being that these households try to capture routine behavior, but are nowhere, like absolutely not uniform. There's preferences, but there's, as you can see, a lot of variability about how long and how frequently each behavior occurs day to day. And, and that was important to us. And each of these activities has like an actual script where the avatar would move objects around, which is what we need for this project. Um, and kind of takeaway from this is that what we want, and there's again, a couple of baselines that model object movement. What we want is we wanna predict which object moved that the user, we wanna predict which uh, objects the user needs like a tennis bag, right? And, and correctly give it to the user as often as possible. And then if the user actually is gonna use something like their tennis bag, we, let's say we predicted that they wanted it, but then we put it somewhere in the wrong place. I took that tennis bag and I hid it in the closet, right? We don't wanna do that. We wanna lower that as much as possible, which is this column. And then the objects the user didn't touch, let's say they didn't play tennis today. Uh, we wanna to touch those objects as, as uh, as infrequently as possible, right? And we want to leave those objects alone so that we're not just randomly moving things around the house, around the person. And so in other words, we're trying to maximize the value in this first column and minimize the ones in the uh, second and third column. Um, and we're comparing against two um, prior works uh, from others in the field. I have a citation here. Um, that look for kind of periodicity in, in object movements and predict uh, how objects move based on, on various patterns of, of uh, usage. Uh, and our work kind of the, with this graph neural network approach that incorporates both time and current state of the world uh, is able to handle this really hard task better than the others. We're really still far. Uh, I'm not actually sure what the ideal, I mean, ideally you should be able to present, predict what the user is doing 100% of the time. But I don't, I actually need to run a human baseline against this at some point because this data is so, so variable. Even a human wouldn't be able to predict what somebody else needs with 100% certainty. This is a really, really hard task. 
that we're still learning, a little bit learning more about. Um, but we've had a lot of fun with this project um, in terms of, um, yeah, getting the robot to basically predict what people need and be an invisible helper uh, without being asked. Uh, any questions on this before I go on to, um, I know there's a lot here and I'm, I'm kind of getting to the punchline, but uh, happy to answer any questions if anyone wants. Um, how would you like update this data set? Like let's say before COVID, I like going out a lot. And then after COVID, I prefer to stay in. And then if I just had a robot, like, you know, train on the before COVID data set, it might like open the door for me around 6 p.m. so I can go out for dinner. But then, you know, during COVID, that's not helpful for me. This is You're right, system. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, one, we haven't done this yet, but one of our goals is to look at this in the continual learning framework so that it, new patterns of behavior. So let's say you start taking lessons in tennis or COVID hits and you start to become more sedentary, um, that all of these factors get uh, factored. You know, Right now you'd have to retrain the model or throw away data and like move it, use a sliding window approach or something else. Um, we, haven't, we haven't tackled that quite yet. That's a great question. All right, well, in the last few minutes, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll cover the last topic that we have, which is the interaction. I'll, I'll just go gloss over it a little bit so I leave time for discussion at the end. Um, but it's this idea that we also want robots to interact with people more directly. Um, and in particular, we've been interested about robots that are autonomous in people's homes, uh, but inevitably, as we all know, what happens to robots is at some point they fail. And, you know, it's, it's just a matter of time. And so there's a question of, you know, you walk into your kitchen and you see a robot kind of standing in front of the counter, it's arm halfway through a movement and it's just, that's it, it's not moving. And you walk in and you, and you wonder like, what the heck happened, right? What's going on? Uh, why didn't the task uh, get completed? And if we as roboticists want this, uh, there's a really interesting question of what happens to users who are not roboticists and they're non-technical users, um, how do we explain robot failures to them? And so we did a couple of projects on how do we generate semantic explanations um, that can enable non-experts, non-roboticists to better understand robot failures. And particularly, we want them to understand what went wrong and how to potentially fix it. And um, across that work, so it's, it's two papers that we did. We did the first one was really at HRI 2021. I'm not gonna go through it in detail here, but it explored just even just the foundational work of what, what goes into an explanation. How, what do you need to include in that explanation statement about the error um, for people to actually recognize errors, the, the source of the error and fix it? And what we found was that as much context about the error as possible is helpful, and that giving some of the history of the actions that happened before the error is also um, really, really helpful that users were better, you know, so again, our scenario is that you walk into a room and the robot's no longer moving. And so being able to kind of have the robot explain what it was doing right before and then, and then it failed is, is helpful. So that was cool. Um, but that, that uh, project that's in HRI 2021 really focused about kind of about the content of the explanations and it, it included a lot of uh, hand-coded elements in, to generate those explanations and so uh, in follow-up work that I'll describe very briefly here we really wanted to go from raw sensor data to natural language all the way from kind of raw sensors to natural language a fully generalizable way to describe the semantic context of the scene and what went wrong. And particularly, we picked manipulation errors because there's a lot of things that can happen in manipulation. So this picture here shows a robot's trying to pick up this blue can. Um, there's partial occlusion. There's a lot of clutter. It might be a motion planning issue because it can't plan around the other object. It might not be able to find a grasp. The object might just be too far away, right? There's like several factors, all of which just look the same when the robot fails because the robot's just like, I can't pick that up. Um, and so. I'll, jump, I'll go through this really quickly, um, but we're using semantic scene graphs, custom semantic scene graphs, kind of customized to uh, grasping errors um, to model occlusion automatically in the visual scene that the robot is, uh, of, the, of the objects that the robot is manipulating. Uh, now, 
these entire semantic scene graphs are really, really rich. There's a lot of objects. They're all next to each other. They're all related in some way. And so if you generate explanations from that, you get things like the robot could not pick up the can because the cans on the table occluded by the pitcher, occluded by the bowl near the fruit and too close to the cups. Ah, that's awful. Too much information, half of it is irrelevant. And so um, there's this really nice um, refinement we can do to kind of draw attention to the right uh, elements so that we can get the right information to the user, such as the robot could not pick up the can because it's occluded by the pitcher and too close to the cups. Uh, the can is visible in this scene, partially. It's just so you can see that it's there, but it's outside the grasping range. Um, and so this is cool to me because we can now go from pixels to a semantic representation to words. And we can now communicate with the user about what the heck's going wrong with the robot. All right, so I'll show you uh, the results of the study. So when there's an R, this is ranked. So these shorter explanations have an R after them, SSG, semantic scene graph R is, is the ranked semantic scene graph. And SSG without the R is just the full semantic scene graph, these really long wordy ones. I'm gonna jump through some stuff. All right, so I'll, I'll build, up, build up these results and tell you really briefly about our study. So we ran a bunch of people. They got 16 scenes. 16 or eight, I can't remember. Um, they, they, they got a bunch of error scenes. First, first thing they show up, we show them a bunch of scenes, don't explain anything. And we just see, can they guess what went wrong, which is the failure case on the left, failure identification. And can they figure out how to fix it, which is solution identification on the, the graph on the right. And it turns out when people just come in, they can guess about 50% of the time what went wrong. Okay, not bad. And if you keep showing them 16 more error cases, over time, they get a tiny bit better. They get about 59% success rate on guessing correctly what went wrong, one of many errors, okay? Now, this is without any explanations or with purple with the wrong kind of explanations, which I'm not gonna talk about. And then if you give them SSG explanations, which are these really wordy semantic scene graphs, they start to, you know, again, before any explanations and after, and after users improve in performance to some degree, because they're starting to hear words like occlusion and too close and other stuff. But because that there's so much noise in that data, it's not particularly useful. And now if I give you the ranked um, semantic scene graph explanations, these are in blue, you get a huge performance up to the 90s right? Over 90% success in identifying the failure and figuring out how to fix it, um, which is cool to me, right? Be and this is, there's two lines in blue, by the way, because the dashed one is the one um, we autonomously generate from vision. Now, because it's an algorithm that generates semantic scene graphs, it has some errors. And so we also by hand annotated them to, to like ground truth semantic scene graphs. And that's the solid line. And you can see even with like some minor errors, there's not a big difference in performance uh, in, as, as it impacts the user. Um, so the, the huge takeaway here is that um, we can go from taking low level sensor data and pass it through kind of a very, very established semantic reasoning process Semantic scene graphs have been for a while, for ages. But because they allow us to establish a, a representation through which we can now communicate with people, and we can leverage that for explanations and to make users more aware of the capabilities of the robots and what's gone wrong in the particular case, which to me is really, really interesting and really important. So, so that's it. That's where we are. Um, I'll say that you know I've, I've talked about all these aspects all around household robotics and all these many things, object grasping, object modeling, and so on. Um, all of these, I think, are little pieces of a puzzle, right? We, what we want is autonomy. What we want is interaction. What we want is, is, is robust autonomy that can recover and all these things. Um, because of the way academia works, for each of these is one little piece to the solution. Uh, over time, we're going to start to combine these pieces more and more, and um, hopefully, with, with the whole community's help, 
uh, get to more robust autonomy in these complex environments. Um, so in particular, huge shout out to the students that led the work that I proposed, that I described. Uh, Wei Yu Lu uh, did the first two uh, projects on uh, grasping and object state modeling. Uh, Devlina Das works on explainable AI and Maithali Patel uh, did the work on um, proactive assistance. And with that, I'm gonna open it up to more questions. And I still can't see you guys, but um, yeah, feel free to jump in if you have a question. And I already got a few, so. Um, I, I have a question. So what do you see as the, it's more of a high level question. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge to um, putting a robot in the home or like in the, in the, in, in, in people's home, like especially for like kitchen tasks and like over all of these problems that you consider, what, what do you think is the biggest challenge? So the question is, what's the biggest challenge to autonomy in the home particular or an environment such as a kitchen? Um, I think to me, I mean, there's so many challenges, it's hard to pick the, the one, um, but partial observation, like partial sensing, uh, I think a lot of our works still assume not perfect sensing, but it's fairly consistent sensing. So for example, I'll take, I'll pick on my work, which is uh, let's take semantic grasping. It was always assuming kind of have a tabletop and then there's an object and you're seeing it from the top. Um, once you're in a real environment, there's so much more occlusion. You're dealing with stuff in cabinets, in drawers, things are on top of each other, behind each other. Um, I think the perception, um, even when perception does work, because perception has so many downstream effects, it affects everything, grasping, reasoning, and so on, that um, I think it'll just be really hard. To, and because also because we have so many different objects, right? The world is just super, super diverse in terms of households, um, that there's a lot of downstream effects that make autonomy really, really hard in the real world, just because it's not as clean, right? We still see most of our works in robotics are tabletop, especially in manipulation, right? We're not very often, like I think about my freezer, like good luck to the robot that has to go extract meaningful things from my freezer where the kids have waffles and whatever else and ice packs and all this stuff kind of in a jum jumbled pile, so. Um, there's, it's. I think the real world is, is messy and hard. <laughs> I wanted to know about your take on like like companies like Tesla with their robot and Amazon purchasing iRobot. Like how far are they truly from this kind of in-home technology versus I guess- Oh, how far? I mean, Right, the most successful robot on the market is a Roomba, right? And, and there's a reason for that or any robot vacuum of that form, form factor. And the reason is that it considers the world as one thing, a floor. <laughs> and if you violate that assumption and you leave your socks out, the robot fails, <laughs> that's it, right? It, it's basically, okay, then now they have cameras for localization, but for the most part, they're like, I don't care about anything else, floors are flat, off we go. Um, anything beyond that and further up has not uh, hit the market. And we are not really seeing mobile manipulation in any uh, semi-structured environments particularly yet. Uh, Diligent Robotics is doing a fantastic job in hospitals, but in a much more limited scope and, and their environment is semi-structured. They're uh, a little bit, they have a little bit of structure. Um, but even that's a really, really hard case. And it's way easier than a household in some ways because they're a set of objects they have to deal with is smaller. Um, but if you just look, start to look at who's doing mobile manipulation in, in industry kind of commercially, 
you, I think there's one European company as well uh, that I can't think of the name of off the top of my head, but very, very few, right? It's really, really hard. So what can we do today in industry? We can do navigation, right? You can get your delivery, your, you know, your donut or pizza delivery um, on campus, that, uh, that works. Um, or we can do a stationary arm strapped to a tabletop or, or upside down the way NVIDIA has it. Those, those domains are a little bit easier. We're still really, really struggling with mobile manipulation. Uh, it's hard because uh, uncertainty tends to explode, right? You have the uncertainty of the base and this lo uh, location and navigation and different perspectives uh, for perception, inability to have a very dense perception field uh, as the way you could in a stationary set setup. So yeah, we're still a long way away from a humanoid being able to do things in the household setting, which is where Tesla is trying to go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, really great uh, to be here. And um, yeah, if anybody wants to follow up, feel free to email me.